Si Miss Dima ano ba ang ano? Reporter? Yes po, Doc. Oh, sige. Uh, yes, wait lang po, Doc. Ah, oh, sige. Doc, wait, uh, ayos lang po yung ano po sa mag-share screen po. Alright. Okay po. So, so, good morning po, Doc and classmates. Uh, we are the second pair of reporters. I am Dani Capulin de Maano with my partner, Ms. Megan Mateo. And we will discuss about the forensic identification of human remains. Next slide, Doc. So, this will be our topics for discussion. What are remains? the importance of identifying remains, three common types of identification, reading biological profile from bone remains, who are involved in the whole process of identifying what can be done in certain situations and sample related cases. So I will be the one to discuss the first half of the presentation and the second half will be for my partner, Ms. Mateo. Next slide, Pop. To start off, what are remains? So it simply means the whole or any part of the body of a deceased individual, irrespective of the time of death. May it be in any stage of uh, decomposition or uh, kahit after cremation. Next slide. Uh, next, the importance of identifying remains. So this is important for both legal and humanitarian reasons because the forensic examination of human remains is crucial to establish a person's identity and the cause and manner of death. So it is essential for identifying missing persons, uh, disaster victims, and uh, casualties of war. But it is not only about solving cases on the legal side since dahil dito, they can also have um, a proper burial, the families can get answers, uh, the certificates can be issued, and most importantly, justice can be attained, justice can be served. Kaya identifying remains is important for both legal and humanitarian reasons. Next spot. Next slide. Uh, now let's move on to the three most common types or the so-called big three of identification of remains. So fingerprints, teeth, and DNA analysis. So when human remains are recovered, these uh, three primary specific methods are traditionally used to identify who uh, those remains belong to. Next book. First is the fingerprint analysis, which looks at the skin patterns on the tips of fingers. Since diba, we all know that everyone has a unique fingerprint, 
event twins, magkaiba sila ng ano, ng fingerprints, di ba? So this is mainly about checking and comparing the ridges, swirls, or sweat glands from our fingers or fingerprints ng victim sa available na fingerprint records nila noong nabubuhay pa. Next po. Second is dental analysis, which looks at the teeth and any dental work such as crowns and fillings. So a forensic dentist can extract DNA from the pulp chamber to cross-match and identify a victim. Investigators can also examine dental records uh, if ever merong available, available to match them to a corpse, like uh, comparing the arrangement and condition of the teeth or uh, to match a, a bite mark to a perpetrator. Next up. And then, um, third of the big three is the DNA analysis, which looks at DNA profiles recovered from soft or hard body tissues. So DNA analysis is considered um, the most, uh, the gold standard for identifying human remains and maybe uh, the only available method if ever hindi available ang iba pang ways like yung nga sa fingerprints and or yung dental records. Next up. Um, identifications are made by comparing the DNA profile of reference samples with those from human remains. And these reference samples we are talking about can be obtained from uh, personal items used by the victim, like a uh, toothbrush, hairbrush, or for boys, a razor. Then another is banked biological samples, yung mga naipatabi na, like sperm or biopsy tissue from the victim and whether it from biological relatives of the victim. Preferably from immediate family members sana, pero if ever, if ever walang wala na talagang, or hirap talaga makakita ng immediate family na mahagi, na ano, yung hirap makahigilap ng immediate family, pwede rin naman yung mga pinsan or uh, tito and tita, basta dapat blood related kasi my certain percentage pa rin yan pagka pinacheck. Yeah. Then, if sufficient na yung DNA na ma-recover, forensic DNA typing can identify the biological samples. So, uh, the information we can get from these three types of analysis, yung fingerprint, dental, and DNA, can then be compared to a data database of records. But sadly, here in the Philippines, I think, Hindi pa super ganun kaayos ang database natin for this kinds of, for this kind of records pero in other countries established na talaga yung records nila so mas madali talaga nila itong nagagamit for identification of remains compare compare dit sa atin next up next slide pa. Uh, so, here are other things which may be useful in identifying remains. Um, the discover of medical implants during an autopsy can also be informative, and this includes the prosthetic joints, breast implants, pacemakers, or dental implants. Then, you investigators, they may be able to link this to the patient records through their unique markings, in trademark, uh, date of manufacture, and serial number. And also, forensic scientists can compare medical images if may available records such as x-rays or CT scans that are taken before and after death. So for head images, unique features such as the sinuses or the arrangement and condition of the teeth can be compared. Then the body scans can also be used to look for um, mas rare, yung mas rare na skeletal features like pag may fractures, amputations, or uh, cancerations. So again, possible itong mga to na magamit if ever may available na records. So sana, hopefully, ayusin na talaga yung database natin, hindi lang dito sa Philippines, kundi pati na rin sa iba pang countries kasi magiging malaking tulong talaga yun for identification of remains.
next level. The next topic po is about reading, reading biological profile from bone remains. So, ang gamit ng bone rem so gamit ang bone remains, we can identify the sex, race or ancestry, age, and we can even identify yung living height. Next po. Uh, first is sex reading. So, ito ay yung kung yung bones ba ay pag may ari ng isang lalaki or babae. And to determine the sex of the skeleton, we must study the pelvic pelvic bones and the skull. And we can also actually determine the sex through sternum, femur, and humerus. But um, more on measurements, sila, so they will be further discussed later in the next topic. Po. Then for now, we'll focus on the pelvis and skull since the comparison of these two is the characteristics and physical features of the bone. Next slide. Po. First is through the pelvic bone. So this is important since um, ito, dito agad natin makikita kung babae ba or lalaki yung may-ari ng mga butong yon. And ito yung karaniwang unang, tinitingnan, unang nakikita. So the general structure of the female pelvis is thinner and less dense in comparison to the thick and heavy male pelvis. And kung mapapansin nyo, um, mas wide talaga yung hips ng girls kaya nga mas ano eh mas curvy siya tingnan compared sa boys so yung overall construction of bones ay heavier since thicker nga sa male and lighter naman sa female a pubic arch as you can see in the picture narrow for male wide for female yung sacrum short and narrow for male long and wide for female then obturator foramen yung dalawang buta sa baba. Egg-shaped siya sa boys and triangular siya sa girls. Then, yung pelvic inlet and outlet. For inlet, heart-shaped and narrow sa male, oval and wide sa female. Then, outlet, um, smaller sa male, larger sa female. And, a woman's pelvis is generally wider and more open than a man's pelvis. So, bakit? It is because the female pelvis has evolved to be as wide as possible to make uh, pang, to make pregnancy or childbirth easier. Next slide. Next is the skull. So, yan, malalaman din natin dito yung sex ng remains. For male, um, merong large brow ridge or sloping forehead. Then, de develop yung ridge where the neck muscles attach. Then, commonly, Merong square chin, tapos acute yung jaw angle, and pointy yung muscle process. Then, as for female skull, uh, sharp yung upper uh, orbital margin, then smaller brow ridge and more vertical forehead. Then, ganito yung itsura ng neck muscle attachment niya. Tapos, more pointed yung chin and my wider angle of jaw. And, kung pointy yung sa male, um, sa female, less pronounced naman yung mastoid process. Next one. Uh, okay, so from here po, my partner will carry on with the discussion. Thank you. So, good morning po. Good morning everyone. I am Meg Mateo and right from this slide, I will start my discussion. So, um, Another thing po na madadetermine natin from the bone remains is the age at death. So, in sub-adults, the infants, kids, or teenagers, the growth and development rate is more predictable. So, the age at death estimate for sub-adult is more precise. So, in the case of adults, yung estimation po is based on the generative changes of the skeleton cell. So, the estimated age interval at the time of death is broader. So, in sub-adults, most important aspect analyzed for determining the age of the bones are the stage of tooth formation, the presence of permanent and deciduous or the baby teeth, the length of the bones, and the stage of the bone formation and the epi epiphyseal fusion. 
Next slide po. So, teeth begins to develop before birth and continue to grow until around 18 to 21 years of age. So, most baby teeth po emerge by the third year of life and the permanent incisors and the first permanent molars emerge between 6 to 8 years of age. Canine premolars and second molars appear between 10 to 12 years of age. So, by observing the stage of tooth formation and the presence of the mixed dentition, the mixed baby teeth and the permanent teeth, the forensic analyst can estimate the age of the remains. But there is an exception. The third molars or the wisdom teeth, although they are usually present by the age of 18, they can also form later in life. So if these teeth are in their early stages of development, that person was likely to be under 18 years of age. So on the other hand, if the third molars are fully formed, that person is likely to be older than 18 years. So next slide po. So what if walang ngipin available? So age can also be estimated by looking at the length and the stage of the bone fusion. So the bone length for sub-adults is estimated by measuring the length of the diaphysis or the bone shaft. Diaphysis is a long shaft of bone which runs between the epiphysis or the ends of the bones. The epiphysis are found at the ends and around in shape while diaphysis is long and cylindrical in shape. So epiphysis po are not taken into consideration kasi in infants and children, hindi pa tapos ang skeletal development. So therefore, epiphysis aren't yet fused at the ends of the bones. So the measure of the shaft length will be compared to data from sub-adults with known age para madetermine yung most likely age at death. But this technique is less reliable in adults as the size and shape of long bones varies more in older people. Um, next slide. And so, since diaphysis and epiphysis aren't initially fused in children, bone remains that are unfused indicate a sub-adult. And bones that are partially fused indicate a young adult. And those that are fully fused indicate an adult. And next slide po ulit. So, in adults naman, the bones that provide more useful information regarding the age at death are the pubic symphysis, the sternum, and the skull. Next slide po. Okay, so age at death. So, the pubic symphysis, it forms the anterior junction of the two halves of the pelvis. So, these bones po develop gradually, so the age can be estimated reasonably well based on the appearance of the symphysis. So in younger adults, the symphysis has a rugged surface with horizontal ridges, and the surface becomes more and more even and bounded by the rim at the age of 35. Next is the sternum. So the sternal end of the fourth rib can also indicate the age at death with reasonable precision. So in children and young adults, the sternal end of the fourth rib is flat, while in adults, a pit begins to form. This process starts at um, around 14 years of age in females and 17 years of age in males. Uh, so this pit becomes more irregular with age, and the walls get thinner and sharper by the mid-30s. So later, bone is first from form on the margins of the walls due to ossification of the coastal cartilage that joins the sternum and the ribs. So last po is we have the skull. Um, the suturus of the skull can also help in estimating the age, but not as precisely unlike for the pubic symphysis and the sternum. So if there are signs of arthritis, such as rounding of the bones, are noticed, the degree of rounding coupled with the size and number of ostrons can help in not narrowing down the age range of the individual and adult. Next slide. Next po, we have the race or ancestry discovery. Okay. So, 
while long bones and teeth can help in estimating the age of the dead person and for determining the gender and the race, the skull bones, especially the face bones, are more useful. So, by observing these bones, a forensic anthropologist can classify individuals into three main races or groups. So, we have here the Caucasoids or the White Europeans, the Native Americans or Asians or Mongoloids, and Negroids or Black or Africans. Next slide. So, for example, Caucasoids have a longer, narrower cranium. Mongoloids have a more rounded cranium, while Negroids have a lower cranium. The next po is the orbits are round and sloped in white individuals, rhomboid in East Asians, and more rectangular in black people. So in determining naman po sa race ng white people, they have a taller and narrower nasal aperture or the opening for the nose, and their nasal spine is more prominent. In negroids, the nasal aperture is generally short and broad, and the nasal spine and seal are small or lacking. Next po is the alveolar prognathism or the protrusion or the bump in the anterior portion of the upper jaw. So, negroids tend to have this, while mongoloids, while in mongoloids, this feature is moderate, and while in caucasoids, this feature is reduced. So, in mandible naman po, it is slender and thin in black people, medium in white ones, and robust in East Asians. Next po, in mongoloids, the face is usually flat in appearance, and their maxillary incisors are shovel-shaped, while the incisors of caucasoid people and negroids are blade-shaped. And... Besides such observation, craniometric data can also be used. And by running statistical comparisons, um, an identified cranium can be assigned to a specific group. Next slide. Next slide po. Thank you. Um, next po, we have determining the living height or the height estimation of a dead body. So we have here femur and tibia humerus. So estimation of dead person's height is based on the length of long bones of the arms and the legs. Um, an instrument called an osteometric board is used for determining the measured stature, which can be slightly different from the forensic stature. So we have formulas for estimating height from skeletal rem skeletal remains, but it differs depending on the individual's race, caucasoids, negroid, and mongoloids. So these formulas are also different depending on the sex of the individual. So we must determine those two factors independently to select the correct regression equation. So which bones are to be used in this formula? So researchers have generated statistical relationships using several different bones and combinations of bones. So, long bones in the legs and arms are used most often, and these include the femur, the fibula, and tibia in the leg along with the humerus, radius, and ulna in the arm. Okay. Um, next slide po. Okay. So, femur and humerus are the two of the largest long bones in the human body. So, they occur singly in the upper part of the limbs. Femur is the long bone of the upper leg, whereas humerus is the long bone of the upper arm. So we have here two methods, the Trotter and Glasser method and the Garwin method. So in the first one, we have the calculation of height using a stature formula, which in case of white males is 2.38 multiplied to the length of the femur in centimeter plus 61.41 centimeter. And for the humerus, we have the formula for white males of 3.08 multiplied by the length of the humerus in centimeter plus 70.45 centimeter. In the next method, in the Garwin method, it gives slightly different numbers. For example, for the height of a white male, 
the formula is 2.32 multiplied by the familiar length in centimeter plus 65.53 plus or minus 3.94 centimeter for a mongoloid male. Oh, sorry. For a white female naman of the same ancestry or a white female, we have the formula of 2.47 multiplied by the familiar length in centimeter plus 54.10 plus or minus 3.72 centimeter. For a mongoloid male, the formula would be 2.15 multiplied by the familiar length of Premier length in centimeters plus 72.57 plus or minus 3.80 centimeters. Then for a negroid male, the formula is 2.10 multiplied by the premier length in centimeter plus 72.22 plus or minus 3.91 centimeters. So we also have other methods of approximating the height of a person. Um, next slide po. So we have here several methods. First, we can measure the distance between the tips of the middle fingers of both hands with the arms extended laterally and it will approximately be equal to the height. Next po, it can be a 2 times the length of one arm plus 12 inches from the clavicle and 1.5 inches from the sternum is the approximate height. Third, um, two times the length from the vertex of the skull to the pubic symphysis is the height. Next po, um, the distance between the suprasternal notch and the pubic symphysis is about one-third of a person's height. Also, we have here the distance from the base of the skull to the cockpit is about 44% of the height. Next, the length of the forearm measured from the tip of the olecranon process to the tip of the middle finger is 5 over 19 of a person's height. And last po um, is 8 times the length of the head is approximately equal to the height of the person. Okay po. Next po. So, in the process of identification of the remains, who are involved? So, we have here the witness, family or relatives, friends and colleagues for personal identification. We also have forensic experts or specialists. So, odontologists. So, in the process of identification of remains, forensic odontologists attempt to identify victims' remains after disasters. So, their help is crucial when facial recognition or fingerprints is not possible. So, they recognize the evidence such as tooth fragments that may otherwise be overlooked by other medical professionals. So, they base their analysis and conclusions on the way teeth wear down with time, how teeth are arranged in the mouth and the imprints they leave. And they also observe dentures, bridges, crowns, braces, and fillings to identify their owner. Next po, we have forensic anthropologists. So they support investigations of both cold case crimes and anthropological mysteries. Unidentified bones or skulls uncovered during construction or mining activities may be sent to them for analysis. So these forensic specialists use their experience, training, and skills to attempt to discern age, gender, race, and any other possible identify identifying characteristics that might, might be enable authorities to put a name and history to the unidentified bones. Next po, we have pathologists. Human remains are treated as a separate and a unique type of forensic evidence. We all know that. And an autopsy of the remain is completed to determine the cause and the manner of any death that is violent, unusual, or untimely. And a forensic pathologist is the one to examine the human remains for the 
post-mortem examination and consider the death scene findings. Last po, law enforcement agencies sometimes call in forensic radiologists to assist with victim identification, especially in mass casualty incidents such as plane crashes. They also help identify remains when a John Doe is found without identification or other clues indicating who he was or how he died. So those are the persons involved in the process of identification of remains. Next slide. Po. So what can be done? So there are three situations. So what can be done in remains submerged in water, um, disaster victims, and body in late stage of decomposition? Next slide po. So in body submerged in water for too long, so um, there is bloating, skin slippage, and wrinkling of hands and feet are common. Cells absorb water until rupture, and there is loss of tissue from several reasons such as effects of the water current, chemical composition of water, industrial waste water, and predation by insects or marine animals and fishes. Another thing is favorable conditions for adipocere. So it is a grayish waxy substance formed by the decomposition of soft tissue in dead bodies subjected to moisture. Next slide po. So let us all know the factors affecting adipocere formation. So first, we have atmospheric condition. So it requires a warm, moist, humid climate. If the conditions are too dry, then it will lead to mummification. And if it is too wet, then the body may macerate or liquefy. Next, for temperature, the optimum temperature required for adipocere formation is 21 to 45 degrees Celsius. Next is moisture. The moisture or the water is necessary in the environment for the complete formation of adipocere, as well as the air movement, because it evaporates the body fluid and decreases the body temperature. Next, po, we have place and media of disposal. So it is seen more prominently and rapidly in submerged bodies or buried bodies. Next po is the soil. The condition of the soil like the pH, the temperature, the moisture, and the oxygen within the grave affect the adipocere formation. Next po is the clothing. So in the victim's body, if clothes are present, then it is observed to accelerate the process of adipocere formation as it retains water. Next po, we have coffin. So if the burial is done within the coffin, then it retards the adipocere formation. And lastly po, water. Adipocere, it is seen faster in warm water than in cold water. So adipocere helps in identification of person as it preserves the features. It helps in estimating the time since death and the place of disposal of the body. If injuries are present, then they are also preserved, so it helps in establishing the cause of death. And the presence of any adipocere formation indicates signs of death and that the postmortem interval is at least of weeks or several months. So next slide po. So here are pictures po of a body submerged in water for like 4 to 12 weeks so that is how they look like so in that situation what can be done next slide po. so in that situation a dna identification is possible but dna identification by itself is not fully reliable from human remains found in aqueous environment so it is more important for other information to be incorporated, such as dental identification, anthropological studies, and further research needs to be done. Next. Slide. 
what can be done in disaster victims. So, after many people die in human-made or natural mass disasters, the work of identify, identifying the victim begins. So, this is a crucial part of the process of grieving the loss of life and for a community to start recovering from a mass trauma. So, forensic, forensic experts or specialists, with they form disaster victim identification teams and they have standard operating procedures for these situations. And these procedures give the best chance of recovering information, successfully identify, identifying remains, and providing initial psychological support to the victim's family. So disaster victim identification expert gathers the victim's data at the scene, and then they obtain dental records, DNA and fingerprint identification, also other individual specific information such as status, prosthesis during post-mortem examination for visual recognition, and information about the victim's lives is recovered via various sources. So this range from the typical medical records and collaboration with suspected victims' families to photographs posted on social media and personal items such as jewelries. So they contact the family members to facilitate this in visual identification. So all of this data or information are used to confirm the victim's identity so the remains can be released to their families. Next slide. Okay, what can be done in body or remains in late stages of decomposition? So we all know that a skin of the scorp has, that has started decaying is the most difficult one to handle. Pero we can still obtain dental records from them as well as DNA identification. And as far as retrieving finger, fingerprints is concerned, there, there are cases that normally only a small part of the ridge pattern perseveres. And that pattern bearing skin of fingertip is peeled off and placed in a solution of formaldehyde. And that skin fragment of each finger is immersed in separate container as the formaldehyde not only retards further decomposition of the skin, but also hardens it. So a rolled impression are recorded using fingerprint pad method. There are cases that the outer surface of the epidermis is broken down and the ridge characteristics are blurred. However, the ridge design on the undersurface of the skin may still persist. And in such cases, the skin is first loosened from the flesh by boiling in water. And thereafter, the skin is peeled off and placed on a cardboard with the inner surface turned outward. Next slide po. Okay, but now we included cases of identification of remains, um, specifically from Barameda and Galliano's case. Next slide, po. So first we have Ruby Rose Barameda Jimenez. So she's a sister of the former actress and beauty queen Rochelle Barameda and has been identified by her family after two years of her mysterious di disappearance. So she was last seen on March 14, 2007, when she visited her children at the house of his husband's family. And after two years of search, Ruby Rose's body was recovered under the waters of Navotas Port when the accused turned witness testified and led the authorities to the area where they dumped the body of Ruby Rose. So her body was found cemented in a steel drum thrown in the waters in Navotas on 2009. Sorry for there was um, error in making the PowerPoint. Her body was found po on 2009. So for identification of her remains, authorities used her clothing and earrings as well as dental records. So. Uh, her family was able to identify her using her clothes, her khaki slacks, her blouse, and her earrings. Yun po. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, po. 
So next po is the missing 23 year old Javelin Galliano. So her body went missing on August 5 this year and her so-called skeleton was found in Barangay Santa Lourdes, Puerto Princesa in Palawan, according to the police. And this daw po are based on DNA test results. So her body was found on August 23, 2002. So Puerto Princesa City Police spokesperson said that 99.9% match the DNA sample taken from skeleton and the swab sample from Galliano's mother. Among her remains were several personal items including a black purse, a phone, and some identification cards. So her relatives asserted that the underwear discovered with the bones was not hers and they doubted the presence of the skeletal remains in light of Javelin's Jov short three-week disappearance. So ito po kasi, um, Three weeks, almost three weeks pa lang po nawawala yung kanyang body. And meron na daw pakitang skeletal remains. And kung may kita nyo po yung picture, hindi lang po namin na-include. Sobrang linis na po nung skeletons. So, um, ang ano lang po namin, ang pinaka-possible po dito is the mitochondrial DNA test. So, it traces a person's matri matrilineal or mother line ancestry using the DNA in his or her mitochondria. So, the this test po is passed down by the mother and changed to all her children, both male and female. And this mitochondrial DNA test can be taken by both men and women. In lang po. Thank you. Next slide po. Okay po, so now we have takeaway messages. So, remains it is the whole or any part of the body of a deceased individual irrespective of the time of death. Next po. So, the big three again of the identification of remains, we have the fingerprint, teeth, and the DNA analysis. Next po. Okay po, we have to... Um, Take note, the biological profile from bone remains to uh, identify the gender, we have the pelvic bones and the skull. The age, uh, we have the teeth and bone fusions. To determine race or ancestry, we have the face bones. And to estimate the living height, we have the long bones from legs and arms. Next slide. I'm oh, sorry, next slide. Okay po. Now we have persons involved in identification of remains. We have the witness, the familiar friends, and the forensic specialist. Next po. Okay po. So these are the references po for the report. So thank you for listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Ako na ba ang host? Hello. Yes, Budo. Yes, Budo. 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 Sige, thank you.